Hello and welcome to part two of my three part series in which I'm talking to you all about how I was able to generate a six figure consulting business in just six months. If you haven't watched the first video, I recommend starting there to learn more about me, my consulting niche, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion, as well as career coaching, and to also learn more about why I decided to start my own business. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel for future updates. In this second video, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that I did before I actually launched my business. Now, this won't be an all inclusive list or a step by step guide for getting your consulting business up and running, but rather a high level overview of let's say seven important steps and actions that I took before I launched my consulting business. These are actions that I believe contributed to my initial success. Of course, success is subjective, right? So this may or may not match your idea of success, which is okay. Again, these are some of the steps and actions that I took, the things that worked for me, meaning, you know, the actions and steps that I took may or may not work for you. And that too is okay, right? We all have our unique paths and needs, desired outcomes, goals, etc. So always do what works for you. My goal with this series is to knowledge share first and foremost, and hopefully inspire or just be a resource for other people who are interested in pursuing similar work. So let's get into it. There were roughly seven really important steps that I took before I launched my business. The first three steps, let's say, were internal actions or work that I needed to do on myself. And the other four steps were more external facing, more logistical, right? And that may not make sense now, but um, hopefully as I talk through some of those steps and actions that I took, it'll, it'll just kind of all come together for you. So step one, I built my confidence. I can't tell you how many times people have told me this throughout life, um, but it, it just didn't sink in until it sunk in. Confidence truly is the key to success. It is probably, I don't know, I don't have the research or the numbers, but from what I've seen, it appears to be, and it seems to be kind of the number one contributing factor to success. And again, everyone's definition of success is different, but I guarantee you, if you were to think of any person that you deem or consider successful, you more than likely also consider that person to be confident, right? Self-confidence can get you so far. And until you believe in yourself, you're, you're gonna be hard pressed to find uh, anyone else that's gonna believe in you. So before I started working on my business, I was taking intentional steps and actions to just build my self-confidence. I've always been confident in my ability to get things done, to learn things, and I've always considered myself to be smart. But in my younger years, I I'd say up until my mid to late 20s, I often felt less knowledgeable than those around me and I would hold my voice back. I had so much fear about what people thought about me and I feared voicing my ideas, my thoughts, my opinions to other people. But over time, right, I came to realize that my voice was just as important as anyone else's. My ideas are just as valuable, just as smart as anyone else's. And so once I realized that, I started to do the work on myself. I went to therapy to start to understand why I had these thoughts and beliefs about myself. I also just started taking better care of myself, my mind, my body, uh, building in small routines to hold myself accountable. And I just did a lot of self-reflection. That leads me to the second action or step that I took, which is I came to term with my weaknesses. For me, it's always been fairly easy to articulate the things I'm good at, but when it comes to things I'm not so good at, my pride used to be a blocker. I don't know about you, but I used to want to be good, okay? I wanted to be great at everything. And growing up, I felt as though I had something to prove, that I needed to be a top performer in everything. You know, now I know why thanks to therapy, but I continued to apply that ridiculous pressure onto myself as I went through my early and mid twenties. And if I'm keeping it a hundred, I mean, I still apply that same unnecessary pressure to myself and I have to check myself. I really do. Until I came to terms with the fact that I don't have to be good at everything and 
if we're being honest, no human will ever be good at everything, right? It's just not possible and that's okay. So again, just examining your weaknesses, I believe is so, so important. When it comes to, to starting and even running your own business, for example, if you know that you're not good at staying organized or completing administrative tasks, or if you know you're not good with branding or design even, find somebody, find someone to do those things for you. Consider asking for help or hiring help. You know, if you're starting a business, there's opportunities to start internships, right? And give back, have a social impact. Just think about all the different ways that you can seek help. At the very least, if you can't seek out help from another person, at least try to find some tools or resources that are gonna make some tasks easier for you. You know, tools that will make you more efficient and more productive. Again, know your weaknesses. And tied to that is this third idea or action that I took before I started my business. And it was just to embrace a growth mindset. So when I was working full time, it was fairly easy, if not almost like forced upon me to constantly be learning. For example, I had managers who would regularly share articles and research documents with me and we'd have conversations around these. Internally, when I worked at companies, there were often and professional development opportunities, you know, that were shared internally. Perhaps there were guest speakers coming in or lecturers. So there were always learning and growth opportunities. But when you're developing a business and even once you have it up and running, especially if you're working independently and remotely as many of us are now, you have to proactively keep yourself educated. When it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion work, as well as career development and coaching, I'm constantly Constantly, constantly exploring and learning, seeking out new things, which in our ever evolving world is, is really important. You always, always want to ensure that your knowledge and your approach to your work remains relevant, right? Fresh, so that you can best support your clients and remain a leader in your field. So I frequently watch videos, um, I'm constantly reading things, I'm ingesting data, I attend webinars and networking events virtually still. Even if it's just, sometimes I'll, I'll dial into a webinar and I'll still be over here like doing other tasks, right? Just listening to it in the background and also checking to see who the attendees are to see what I can do with that list. I also have regular check-ins with other DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion professionals and consultants that I've met along the way, as well as career coaches. And the idea is that we just connect and we knowledge share or we'll bounce our ideas off of each other. Or especially with my fellow DEI folks, sometimes we just air out our grievances because it is an emotionally draining and taxing space. So in addition to, you know, staying up to date with knowledge, it's just good to just have that moment with someone who someone who gets it, right? So I highly, highly encourage you to keep your network going. Learning constantly will ultimately help you and your business thrive. So like I said, the first three actions were more so about the internal work that I had to do uh, on myself. These next four actions are more external facing and more about the logistics behind, you know, preparing to open or to launch your business. So action four, step four, I networked like it was a part-time job. It was my job. No, but really it was my job. So I mentioned this in the first video, but before I left my last full-time job, I was networking, I'd say with at least one to two people per week. And I was doing that for quite some time. I started by first telling my existing network what I was trying to do, which was start my own consulting and coaching business. And several people in my existing network had relevant connections and they were able to make some introductions for me, which was fantastic. That actually led to some of my first clients. I also went on to LinkedIn and some other platforms and I started finding people there to just network with. More specifically, I looked for diversity, equity, and inclusion consultants and career coaches. So people People who were already doing the work that I wanted to do and I made it a point to network with a very very diverse group of people people of all ages genders ethnicities locations right I didn't just limit myself to interacting with people in the US I touched I reached out to people in uh, you know the UK in Asia like I made sure I cast a very very wide net and I think this is really really important when I do career coaching I like to remind my clients especially black women 
women, women of color, to never limit yourselves to just networking with people who look like or are like you or share a similar background experience as you do. It's so important to diversify your network as much as possible. Not only increases your ability to reach more people and reach more clients, but it expands your knowledge, it opens your perspective, and you further develop cultural competency or the ability to just comfortably and confidently interact with people of various backgrounds, right? And many people overlook that skill, but having worked within the DEI space for quite some time, I can tell you that in the coming years, more and more people and organizations are going to be embracing and looking for cultural competency as a core skill or ability. So build a diverse network and in turn, aside from expanding your network, expanding your knowledge, you also develop a new skill, which is cultural competency. Now, I figured out what my niche was. Initially, I wanted to offer career development and coaching to support to everyone. <laughs> Literally anyone. But for many reasons, that just wasn't the right approach. I won't list out all those reasons here, but the advice I received over and over again from existing coaches and consultants was to think about my ideal client and focus my attention there. For me, my ideal coaching client is actually kind of focused, right? It's someone who can benefit from both my personal and professional experiences and my DEI expertise and is a professional of color and even more specifically a woman of color, a black woman who is making a career shift to better align their skill sets and their interests to work that also generates income. That is, as you see, kind of me just narrowing it down, kind of tapering down who specifically my target client or ideal client is. And I can tell you as I've built out my coaching business and the various content and resources for my clients, it's become much easier to do um, the narrower my targeted audience is versus when I was just trying to build content. Initially, I was, again, just thinking, oh yeah, I wanna provide career development or career coaching for anyone. And that's so difficult to do. Figure out your niche. It's that simple. It's not that simple. I lied, it's not simple. It takes time. But again, think about who your ideal client is. Who are you trying to serve? Who do you wanna help at the end of the day? That's really what it's about. Now, the sixth action that I took was to formally set up my business. Now there are tons and tons and tons of resources out there that will walk you through step by step, if not do it for you, um, how to start a business, right? So I won't go into detail here, but at a very high level to get started, what I did was to first choose a name. Um, I did have a creative or fun or unique business name in mind and I know how I am. If I spent too much time trying to think about it, I would get into this mode of analysis paralysis and keep overthinking and just never get it done. So I didn't waste time trying to figure out a cool cutesy name. I just went with my name, Adrielle Parker, LLC. Very meta. Um, I then registered my domain or my website URL. I'd already been using my name on a variety of social media platforms. So there wasn't a lot to do there. And like I said, I'm very meta. I like to keep things simple. So I am pretty much at Adriel Parker on every social platform. Finally, I formally registered my business and opened a business checking account. Now I chose to set up an LLC after doing some research. It just made the most sense for me. There are a number of business structures out there, sole proprietorships, corporations, etc. So you'll want to do your due diligence and research and choose the business structure that makes the most sense for you and what you're trying to accomplish. As I was doing my research, trying to figure out what my structure should be, I found Google, YouTube, hey, Reddit, and Quora to be my best resources when trying to decide which model made the most sense for my business. Networking, of course, was also beneficial. All right, finally, the seventh action or step that I took to develop my brand and marketing strategy. So once you found your niche, you need to start developing your brand and your marketing plan, right? Or strategy. That's, you know, your logo, your communication style, your communication outlets, right? What colors are you going to use? Um, where are you going to market? How do you identify your target audience, etc. And keep in mind, design matters. When it comes to attracting clients and selling services or products, you want your brand and the corresponding collateral and materials to appeal 
to your ideal client or target audience, right? So that may require you to do a little bit of research to understand who your ideal client is or your target audience is. And if developing brand and marketing strategy isn't something that you're comfortable doing or that you are knowledgeable in, that's okay. Again, acknowledge your weaknesses and don't be afraid to ask for help, right? One of my favorite things is to leverage your network, right? If you know that you have someone in your network who's really good at branding and marketing, reach out to them, give them that work. And you can always consider bartering, right? Like, hey, I specialize in this, let me do this thing for you. In return, you do this thing for me. Don't limit yourself. Those were the seven high level steps that I took before I launched my business. Number one, I worked on my confidence. Two, I started to identify and come to terms with my weaknesses, embracing them. Number three, I took on a growth mindset indefinitely, right? So I'm constantly learning, constantly seeking out new information. Four, I networked like it was a part-time job. Five, I figured out my niche. Six, I took steps to formally set up my business. And then seven, finally, I developed my brand and marketing strategy. I hope you found this video helpful. Please comment and share feedback and let me know what questions you have. I'll do my best to respond to everyone. And finally, please subscribe to my channel for updates and more content. In the third and final video of this series, I'm going to share steps that I took to actually launch my business and start generating clients and revenue. The link to that video may be found in the description. Thanks again for watching and I hope to see you here soon. Thank you.